So very first thing up, please uh, allow me to uh, say thank you to everybody for coming tonight. Uh, the Sacred Heart University Performing Arts Department and the band program, we're excited to bring together our four guest composers for this evening's panel discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to just ask everyone to please make sure that your microphones are muted and please keep your videos on so that we can see each other and we can feel a sense of community here tonight. This evening's panel discussion is going to be recorded and we will post it on the Performing Arts Department YouTube channel uh, probably sometime next week. So take a look for that. Uh, first, I want to introduce our guest panelists for tonight. I'm going to introduce them one at a time, and then we're going to talk, have them talk a little bit about their music. Uh, so we're going to start with the music of Dr. Frank Ticelli, who composed In C. Dorian, that the band is working on, has been described as, his music has been described as being optimistic and thoughtful, lean and muscular, and brilliantly effective. Uh, he is the recipient of the 2012 Arts and Letter Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and his orchestral and band works have been performed around the world. Here at Sacred Heart, we've performed a number of his pieces over the years, including Amazing Grace, Angels in the Architecture, and Vesuvius. When he's not busy writing new works or guest conducting around the world, Dr. DiCelli is also a professor of composition at the University of Southern California's Thornton School of Music. Our next panelist is Dr. Benjamin Taylor. He's the composer of Earth Resonance, another piece that we're working on. And he has a catalog of more than 100 works that covers a large range of styles and genres, including music written for orchestra, wind band, opera, choir, jazz big band, gamelan, chamber ensembles, and soloists with live electronics. Dr. Taylor has received commissions from a number of prominent ensembles, including the Omaha Symphony, New World Symphony, American Composers Orchestra, and the Cleveland Chamber Symphony. His music has been played at numerous festivals and conferences around the world, including the College Band Directors National Association Conference, the Society of Electroacoustic Music in the United States, International Double Reed Society, Scandinavian Saxophone Festival, and International Jazz Festivals in Edinburgh, Marlborough, and Birmingham. In 2013, he was the winner of the Ticelli Composition Contest, named after one of our panelists tonight, Dr. Frank Ticelli. Our next panelist, after 15 years of being a band director and music educator, Jennifer Rose now devotes her time to composing. She holds professional artist certificate in composition and a master's degree in composition and technology from the North Carolina School of the Arts, as well as a bachelor's degree in music from the University of Arkansas. She has won top honors in composition competitions at the University of Arkansas, the Foundation Orchestra Association, and in 2014, she was honored with two awards from the Boston Metropolitan Opera's International Contempo Festival. Though she composes works for orchestra, band, choir, chamber ensemble, and soloists, Mrs. Rose has recently been focusing on developing works for adaptable ensembles and fixed media. And the Sacred Heart Band is working on her piece, Imminent Danger, which in fact is for flexible ensemble and fixed media. And our next panelist is Jeff Herwig. Jeff is a rising composer in the band world. And in 2020, the Sacred Heart University Band joined a consortium to commission his newest work, Nightmare, which the band will perform later this fall. Jeff is currently the director of bands at Mercer Area Middle and Senior High School in Mercer, Pennsylvania, and he is the founder of Eminem Music, based out of Mercer, Pennsylvania. Many of Jeff's works for concert band and chamber ensemble are distributed exclusively through his Eminem Music Press. His piece, The Bridge, was recently chosen as a winning composition in the Pennsylvania Music Educators Association 2019 Composition Contest. In 2020, Jeff founded the Three Rivers Wind Symphony, which he is the conductor and artistic director. It's a professional wind ensemble dedicated to expanding the diversity of the wind band repertoire. Jeff completed his undergraduate work in music education at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania and recently earned his Master of Music in conducting from Messiah College. So those are our panelists for this evening. Gentlemen, ladies, thank you very much for joining us all. Um, I'd like us to begin with uh, Dr. Ticelli. We're going to have you uh, introduce and talk about your piece in C. Dorian. Thank you very much, Keith. It's a pleasure to be here. And by the way, my name's pronounced Tikelli. Uh, with a name like Johnson, it's easy to not mispronounce that Understood. one, but mine is difficult to pr pronounce, so <laughs> no worries. 
Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and to, it would help, Keith, if you would give me an idea of the window. How much time would you like us each to speak? About, uh, about 10 minutes or so. About 10 minutes. Okay, great. Well, um, and I'm going to share my screen. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see all your faces. Uh, I'm going to uh, first actually share a couple of websites for you here, uh, a couple of links. Um, one is the website for creativerepertoire.com. The other is the Facebook page where people can go and visit and, and share their works, their adaptable works with others. And, and so it's, it's literally, it's meant to sort of promote works by others who are doing adaptable works. So I'll give you a quick background. I um, founded the, the uh, Creative Repertoire Initiative back in April, back at the very big, we were still getting used to the new normal, right? The whole new reality. And I got a call from a friend named Alan McMurray. He said, Frank, we're in trouble in the fall. Bands everywhere, all over the world are in trouble. There, maybe only five students can show up in a room, if that many, especially where wind players are involved. We've got big trouble. They can't, we can't have rehearsals as usual with large ensembles. What are you gonna do about it? That was basically what he said. And I thought about it and, and out of that, that phone conversation, I thought, well, I can write adaptable pieces. That is pieces played by ensembles of any size and makeup. No matter who shows up in, a, in the rehearsal room on a given day, they can play the music. That was sort of the challenge I set for myself. And there's a history of that. There are these pieces called flex pieces that have been around for a long time, but I wanted to do something even more adaptable than flex pieces, where literally anyone who shows up in the room can realize the piece. And so that's sort of what I did. And then I, I, I enlisted others. I just got on the phone and called friends, basically, just composers who had written a lot for wins um, and who were friends. And I just asked them if they would join me. Just people like Eric Whitaker, John Mackey, um, Omar Thomas, um, Julie Giroux, all these people who are sort of known in the wind ensemble world. I just asked them if they would join me and they all agreed to join in with me and write adaptable music. I thought, well, that's gonna help do more good. But then even then we thought that's not enough. The 12 of us would not be enough. And that's why we founded, we started this Facebook page and founded this initiative so that others could, could, could um, put their pieces on this Facebook page in, right into the window there and just say, this is what I wrote, this is adaptable. So that it now has become kind of worldwide. It all started with that little phone call from Alan McMurray. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about the a little bit of background about the about creative repertoire initiative. It all began with just this little phone call, as I said, and it's kind of grown now uh, worldwide. So I'm really happy about that. Happy to know that there are composers all over the world who want to help, and it just it's a reminder to all to music educators that we've got you're not alone in all of this. People are the, wanting to help you. Composers want to help. So the piece I'm gonna share is called N.C. Dory and it was inspired by Terry Riley's work. Terry Riley is a great American composer. He wrote a piece way back in the, in the early 60s called N.C. And it's a piece that uh, is based on little motives, just these little cells, little cellular pieces. In fact, it's kind of often called a cellular composition. Players can play from these cells and repeat them at at their leisure and then go on to another cell. When they get tired of one, they go on to another and so forth. And um, I was inspired by that because I thought, well, this is a perfect kind of thing for, uh, for, for our time right now. So I'm gonna share with you the score first so you can just see what I'm talking about here. Um, share the screen, computer sounds, here it is. So on the right side of the screen, you all see this right here. I can make it a little bit larger for those of you who are on small laptops. Uh, laptops and so forth there. Um, this, is, this is basically the piece right here. There's no score, there's no conductor score. Actually, what I'm sharing with you here is actually the choral version. I, when I say anybody can show up in the room and perform it, I mean anybody. I mean string players, wind players, and even singers. This particular one, the only difference between this and instruments in C is that I added little syllables to, to be sung. So, you know, the first note. This uh, pum 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 pum. There's your first cell right there. The second cell pum 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 pum. Right, you can all see that as I'm singing along. Number three, pum pum pa. That's pa. Pa pa 
pa, 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 so forth. And if you're in a lyrical mood, you can, you can start this piece on number five. The players can start on any cell they want. You don't have to start with cell number one. You can just start way, way. And then you can skip around. You can start with number five and then go back up and do number one. So you can do them in any order. And as you will see, there are three pages. Here's page two. You'll see more 16th notes. It gets more syncopated, number 10. That sort of thing, but still some lyricism here, number 12. And then that's number 13 and so forth. And by the time you get to page three, it's just lots of 16ths. Uh, what is that? That sort of stuff. And by the end, it's and then everybody by the end is just on this loud uh, playing either note of the quarter. So the idea is it gets louder and, and more and more notes per square inch. So that's the score. I'm going to play with for you the um, Atlantic Reed Consort. That is a group on the on the uh, East Coast. Who, who did this work. They did it in a parking lot. This is kind of cool. They did it in a parking lot uh, at night, in a parking structure rather, and just car lights were the spotlights. Instead of spotlights of the kind that you would have in a rehearsal hall, they just use their automobile headlights and that's their spotlight. So it's kind of cool. I have been told that the, the video, YouTube video is a little bit um, jumpy. It's, you know, it's stilted because, because of Zoom. It won't broadcast smoothly so you're going to probably see that happen i'm going to i have it set up so you can see the a little bit of the video on one side and you can see the score on the other side so you can take your pick what you wish to see so this is one performance of nc dory and, it, and it's been done many times there was another performance by 21 musicians um there's been a performance by singers it's been a performance by string players every time it's done it's it's completely different because the players control the shape of the piece they control Basically, the form, you don't have to, as I said, you don't start with number one. The players can start with number four and skip to the second page. You have complete control over, over the cells you choose. So I like the idea of giving up some of the controls that I've had all my life as a composer. I've given that up in this piece. And I thought that was kind of cool and in the spirit of our times right now. So again, this is five players. This is um, the Atlantic Reed Consort. Uh, here we go. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it once it starts. Can you hear? Thumbs up? Okay.
Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. There you go. I love that audience of one applauding. I mean, there was no audience, right? It's in a parking structure. So <laughs> I love. I don't know. Was it pretty jumpy? The the video was it was it was it stilted a little bit? No, it was fine. At least on my end, okay. it was fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, any questions from anyone? Any any comments or questions you guys might have? Here's your chance. Because it looks like I have maybe one minute. Or you can just stare at me. Well, do you think the concept would work as well with strings? Absolutely. And in fact, it's being done by uh, uh, Winnipeg Symphony is doing it very soon and it's strings. And so I'm really eager to see their video. Uh, it were, it'll work quite well with strings. And as I said, I've got parts for any instrument. There's parts in E flat for alto sax. There's parts in F for horn. There's parts in alto clef for viola. There's parts in treble clef for the violin as that part you just saw. So any instrument can do this. And I'm very eager to see how it, go, how it works with strings. They might even choose to do a combination of bowing and pizzicato, who knows? You must be a string player to ask that question. Excellent, I was just curious. Ah, okay, cool. Okay. Well, thank you all. It's a pleasure to share that piece with you. And uh, a pleasure to, to be here with you as well. I look forward to he hearing and seeing the other pieces as well. Thank you so, so, so much, Dr. T to Kelly. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, let's go on now uh, to uh, Benjamin Taylor. Uh, we are working on his piece, Earth Resonance. Uh, so, Ben, take it away. Thanks. Yeah, I am so honored to be here. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like the young buck uh, among such fine composers. And honestly, it's so good to see so many people on video on Zoom. I've been doing a lot of guest composer residencies and sometimes, you know, half the people are not on video. So it's, thank you, <laughs> you know, for letting us feel like we're in the same space with you guys. Um, and uh, hey, Frank, I, I've been a part of numerous uh, performances of NC, uh, the original, uh, you know, Terry Riley version, and I can't wait to be a part of one of yours down the road here, because that That's is a really cool, cool, great, great rendition, man. That's Very cool. cool. By the way, it's dedicated to Terry Riley. It's right I on the top of the screen. That. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Keith, thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. So yeah, Earth Resonance. I wrote it last year, pre-pandemic, <laughs> uh, for for Flex Ensemble and Electronic Track. Although of course the premiere was canceled because of the pandemic. I talked to the commission director, Brittany Cole, and, and she said, yes, you know, you absolutely need to get it out there. Let other people use it during these crazy times. Uh, Cause she, she still has not premiered it with her own group yet. Uh, but people around the country are doing it now. So I guess, wait, raise your hand students. Are you playing this? You guys already started working on this? Yeah, okay, all right. So you already know the vibe. It's like this, um, I'm calling it, it's in the chill step genre of dubstep music. Some of you will know what that genre is. <laughs> uh, for those that don't, it's, it's like a meditative dance track, um, a minimalist meditative vibe. Here, I'm gonna play just a clip of it and then I'll talk a little bit more. Share screen, share computer audio. All right. We're hearing this, right? As you saw, th that performance just happened last week. It's, it's really recent. 
Uh, so that gives you a little taste of the piece. Uh, as I was writing it, Keith wanted me to, to give a little bit of a background of how I composed it. And um, I, I explored, I, I wanted the idea of what would infinity sound like as a motive? Like, so, so, so for me, this piece is, is all about like connecting to earth and connecting to, uh, to those around us. And uh, I don't know if you guys have heard that the earth actually like resonates at a certain frequency. And anyway, I got way into that vibe. Uh, and so I, so the, the primary motive of the piece is this little and it starts out here and, you know, kind of collapses in on itself and then goes back out and um, all that's related to the universe and, and all that stuff. And specifically, uh, are you guys familiar with, if I say Ouroboros, does anybody know what that is? Go ahead and unmute and tell us if you know what that is. Nobody knows. Oh, okay. I, mean, I know if you want, but yeah. Yeah, go. Uh, or Ouroboros, it's the symbol of like the snake uh, eating itself in like a continuous loop forever. Yeah, exactly. It's like this circle of snakes eating its own tail and it, it's to represent infinity. Uh, you know, the birth and death cycle kind of thing. Um, thank you, Michael. Great job. And so so there's a, there's, there's melodic uh, riffs that are these infinity riffs, these things that just repeat, uh, these ostinatos that, um, because they collapse inward and then go back outward, they're just these infinity Ouroboros riffs. So anyway, that's just a little bit of behind the piece. I do a lot with audio tracks uh, and live performance, uh, as well as video and live performance. That's, that's what I'm into right now. I feel like the rising generation uh, needs needs to have music that they can perform live as well as connecting with what they're so used to with earbuds and video. And I just, I think it enhances the live performance. I'm not trying to take away from the live performance by any means. Uh, and they're not films. I haven't, I don't do film scores. Um, there are any of my videos are more artsy oriented. Uh, I also wanted to, um, uh, Keith asked me to speak a little bit about how COVID has impacted my writing. So in July, I, I hosted Music Creators Academy, which was for middle school and high school students. We came together on Zoom just like this and made music in a large ensemble format and in small ensemble formats, all music specifically written for performance on Zoom so that it could have uh, latency and still work. Um, it was so, so awesome and so rewarding. And so what has come of that has are, are several pieces. I'll, sh I'll show a little uh, fragment of, uh, of one called Snitchin' in the Kitchen. This is inspired by my brother, Josh, who has autism. He loves to bake brownies. And every time he does, of course, he snitches a good deal of the brownie batter. I'm sure you guys all do too. Hey, ben, I'm not alone. <laughs> we're, we're actually going to start to work on this piece. Uh, we, we break classes uh, on November 23rd, 24th, everybody goes home. And then this is a piece that we're going to work on to do a virtual version of uh, for the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this one's not performed live. Everybody recorded their own videos uh, and then we amalgamate them all together, like, like Eric Whitaker's virtual choir stuff. And you're going to see that as a composer, I gave a lot of free reign in terms of uh, choreography. Um, I, I give them some instructions, like at the beginning here, they're supposed to be walking down the hallway towards their kitchen. And then on cue, they all flip their light switches on. They're grabbing their mouthpieces and stuff out of like the silverware drawer, uh, assembling their instruments. And then of course they start to play along with this funk style groove track. Here it is, I'll stop talking.
All right, so uh, briefly here, the students get to improvise some backgrounds uh, on kitchen implements of their choice during, there's a, there's a solo section, qu like quasi big band chart solo section. Um, they also, uh, at one point, several of them, uh, or as a section, they're told that they need to improvise visually some choreography uh, behind one of the soloists. They come up with some really cool stuff. It was so fun to put together. Um, so yeah, you know, the pandemic has been really difficult for me artistically because I write music for large numbers of people to be played in front of large numbers of people and that's not happening. And I, I just feel like it's at the same time, it's opened a lot of doors. I I'm getting to work in, in settings where it's pushing myself in new directions and I'm, I, I love it. It's so fun. And, you know, is it equal to concert music performance? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't even care to debate that. It's, it's working right now. It's fun. It's engaging. It's compelling to me. And I, of course I look forward to when we can make music again in person, but for now I'm going to keep enjoying making music. So thanks again for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you so much, Ben. Really looking forward to working on uh, your next piece as well. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, Jennifer Rose. Uh, Jennifer, uh, take it away and talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing and uh, imminent danger. Hi, thank you, Keith, for um, having this, putting this all together. We really appreciate it. Um, I was a band director for 15 years, and um, I've been a small school band director with a high school band of 8th through 12th graders, topping out at about 32 players. Um, so I've always had a need for flexible instrumentation and my composition background allowed me to arrange whatever I needed for the students. Um, so my final year teaching was actually last year, um, during the pandemic. I, in February, I had given my notice of, uh, resignation and then a month later, uh, we had the longest spring break ever. Um, the, the difficulty was living in a very small town with one stop sign and nothing else um, other than a school and a post office. There's not a lot of um, technological capabilities. We didn't have a lot of internet capabilities. And so I was not able to get very many students to participate in the virtual setting. Um, and when I did, I noticed it was extremely difficult to play along with the click tracks that that I heard, that I found. Um, and I, I made videos for them and um, tried to play along with them. And it was just extremely difficult. So, and, and that was as a seasoned performer. So I decided, well, with my background in technology and stuff and, and music technology, I'm just gonna hop on GarageBand, hop on Logic, and I'm gonna overproduce um, a click track. To, I made some exercises just for the kids to, to try at home. Um, and I was having a blast with it. And um, the kids were really enjoying it. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna do more of this. And it turned into about a new piece every week or week and a half. Um, just a lot of fun. Um, I love techno. I love dubstep. I love, oh my gosh. Um, I just, I love electronic music with a really solid beat. Um, I don't know if that, I've always wanted to mix those, um, those worlds, classical music and, you know, electronic music in the form of, you know, a rave, I guess. <laughs> um, but legal, of course. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and, um, I'll uh, share imminent danger with you. This one was one of the toughest one that I wrote to that point. Um, this was about my fourth piece. And I, um, I wrote this because I wanted to work on syncopation. Um, I wanted to offer something for more advanced players on syncopation. So this is imminent danger. All right, you guys got it all up there? Okay. 
All right, so the score is on the left and um, I'll play the SoundCloud um, recording right here for you. And there you have it. So uh, I forgot to, to mention at the beginning. So I worked with um, a, just a, a huge variety or a small variety actually of um, instrumentation. And I would have a tenor saxophone, a tuba and a flute um, and a uh, sad and lonely percussionist with only a bell set at home. And so I came up with a way of just doing parts. So any four instrumentalists could play this at once. Originally though, this piece actually started out as a string piece and um, I wrote it in a, a different key for strings. And then whenever I went to arrange it for, um, for winds, I realized that that was not gonna work. The key signature just didn't work. Um, I wanted to make it as comfortable as possible um, within the band world and within the orchestra world. So you can't combine the two. Um, on this particular piece, but my subsequent pieces you can. Um, this score is written for a, compo a conductor to just look at the four main parts. These are not necessarily the only, uh, this doesn't have to, part one doesn't have to be played by flutes and oboes, part two doesn't have to be trumpet, and it can be anybody. This is just how I originally wrote it. So, um, I, whoops. Hey, Jennifer, a quick question. Yes. So I'm just looking parts three and four in bass clef. You have parts in treble clef then for parts three and four as well. Yes, I did. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's fully adaptable then. Yeah, and there's only a few of my pieces that are not. Um, now, I did do flexible instrumentation before this, um, but once the pandemic hit and I realized that I was only going to have like three or four students participating at a time, I figured it was like that everywhere. And so I started adapting it to where anybody can play any part. Um, now, granted, if a tuba player is playing part one on this in, in their range, it's actually going to be more advanced for them. So it really depends on how the instrumentalists, which part they decide to play and how difficult it is. So um, the, the pandemic hit, hit home with me on, uh, as a band director, I didn't get to see my students and I did not realize how much I needed to see them every day um, to feel like I was doing my part for society. Um, so it was, it hit home, but then whenever I was able to start putting pieces like this together, um, it, it opened up a whole new world for me. So, and thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you so much for going over all that. That's great.
let's go to Jeff Herwig next. Uh, Jeff is the composer for a new piece called Nightmare. And uh, Jeff, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, when you uh, posted that picture with our, our photos on it this morning, I looked at it and I was like, there has to be a mistake. Why is my face on the same thing as Frank to Kelly? Like it was, uh, it was very um, humbling. So thank you so much for, for inviting me. Um, it's, it's an honor. Um, <clears throat> I guess I need to start talking about Nightmare um, in terms of how COVID sort of impacted it because it uh, began being written, or I guess I started writing it or conceiving it at least in February um, and composed the beginning of it um, and then started sort of organizing the consortium around it. And by the time all these people had signed up uh, about a month later, the world kind of shut down um, and COVID sort of uh, flip flopped not just my life, but also my ability to write. Um, you know, outside of composing, I'm a uh, middle school, high school band director, also in a rural setting. So very small school district with very limited um, internet access. Um, <clears throat> And so whenever we got sent home on March 13th, uh, when our state closed down, uh, I had to attempt to teach from home. So kids that had internet, I had to put together, uh, you know, asynchronous instruction online for them. But the majority of the kids who don't have internet, um, we had to like put together packets uh, <laughs> for them to work through on their own. And that's not really a good way to, to teach band. So it, it was kind of an adventure. Um, and it was like a 12 hour job every day. So on top of, uh, of that, and also I have two small children who were both um, under three at the time. So I had to watch them while attempting to teach and attempting to write. So um, writing kind of took a back seat for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so usually what I do whenever I go into a writing slump like that, um, I just kind of try to write something every day. And uh, you know, my philosophy is if I write enough junk in a row, eventually something nice is gonna come out. Um, but that didn't really work with this. So I actually just put everything aside um, for like three to four weeks in May um, and early June. And I just, I mean, I thought about all the projects that I was working on at the time, but I didn't actually sit down, sketch anything out, try something out on the piano. I just kind of let it be, took care of my teaching job and took care of my actual children. Um, and then after that little break, miraculously, um, the the second half of, of Nightmare was, was born. Um, <clears throat> About Nightmare itself, it's a piece for band and electronics. Um, and it's actually a sequel to another piece of mine, which is called Afraid of the Dark. Um, Afraid of the Dark is the grade one and a half piece for band and electronic accompaniment. And uh, it was inspired by a piece by Stephen Bryant called The Machine Awakes. Um, my first year teaching, I went to a middle school honors band and my students who I brought with me got to perform that piece um, as part of the festival. And it was my first experience hearing um, electroacoustic band music. And I just, I was blown away with how cool that was. Like, I didn't realize that was a thing that people could do. Um, and I'm also a sucker for like, you know, like sci-fi and horror music and things like that. So that was right up my alley. Um, <clears throat> and then a couple years later, whenever I um, was commissioned by a good friend of mine, um, I approached her since it was for a young band, like a grade one to a grade one and a half band, um, I asked if she would be okay with me doing an electroacoustic piece. And that's where Afraid of the Dark came from. Um, and, you know, I didn't really realize this at the time, but it ended up being my most widely performed piece, um, unexpectedly. So this, this past summer, or I guess earlier in the spring, um, I decided to put together a consortium for a second piece. Uh, that's one grade level higher. So it's a grade two and a half called Nightmare and it's exactly, it's about exactly what it sounds like. Um, <clears throat> it's sort of in, in two sections. So uh, the beginning uh, is like this little introduction and you'll hear uh, a lullaby, um, rockabye baby, but set in kind of a creepy tone. And as things start to escalate, that's kind of like supposed to be the person dozing off and falling asleep and then eventually following, falling into a nightmare. Um, <clears throat> and then about two thirds of the way through everything just kind of halts and there's like these metallic noises. There isn't too much, you know, tempo. There isn't too much moving going on. And that's supposed to like um, represent, you know, like sleep paralysis or like waking up from a nightmare and thinking that you're done uh, with it. But then you sort of fall back into it and that's how the, the piece ends. Um, 
other than that, it's a very simple piece. I mean, it's it's for a younger a younger uh, band, like you know, a middle school band. So there's nothing too complex about it in terms of um, you know harmonic structure or, or anything like that. But um, I used uh, Logic Pro to put together the the recording. Um, actually, for Afraid of the Dark, we did like a little um, uh, project with the students that did that one. So I recorded that entire track on GarageBand. Okay since it was, you know, a little bit more um, user-friendly for younger kids. So uh, just a side note, if you listen to Afraid of the Dark later, the accompaniment for that is written on GarageBand versus Logic Pro, which is a little bit more advanced. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. And since I teach in farm country, this is the first time I'm sharing a screen. So I'm going to assume that I just click on share screen and share computer sound. Okay, beautiful. <clears throat> cool, can you see? Yes. Okay. So recording on the left side and I'll scroll through the score here on the right side. Um, this piece is still very much uh, in its infancy. Uh, there have just been two performances so far. Um, one was done live, but live streamed in an empty auditorium in Iowa. And then uh, just yesterday, a band uh, posted a, a pre-recorded like a virtual band performance of it. So uh, this is the, unfortunately, the mock-up. Can everybody hear that?
And there you have it. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, Thank you. So let's do this. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, what I'd like to do is let's open this up for any questions that anybody might have of uh, any of our panelists. Um, you can either type them in the chat or just, uh, which is probably actually the easiest thing to do since we have so many folks. So if you have a question, please go ahead and uh, just go ahead and type it there in the chat and uh, we'll get to that. And while we're waiting for folks to get their uh, get their keyboards out and start writing, um, can I ask uh, just sort of a general question um, of of everybody in the panel? Do you think that this the, the the current kind of impact that's had on bands and ensembles as a result of COVID? Um, it's obviously had an impact in the kinds of music that we're all playing and the way in which we're playing. Uh, what kind of long-term impact do you think that that might have on the field? Anybody like to jump in with that? Go for it, Jennifer. Um, I have a feeling and I'm hoping that there's a little bit more incorporation, more ease of incorporating electronics um, into performance. I, I know as a conductor, I was a little bit not shy about it, but I was a little bit um, anxious about incorporating electronics, but as a performer, it's, I love it. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, I think it's, there's gonna be a long-term effect. Um, the music is certainly, um, vital right now and crucial right now but after long after this pandemic has come and gone i think this music is going to have legs because there are a there are going to be lots of ensembles that are going to take years to recover from this to build back up their numbers and also there have always been ensembles where there where you don't have enough players and so there's a need for the music in that way so that those, for those two reasons, I think the music's going to have long-term legs. Um, I think also, though, it's not going to replace regular concert band music, and nor should it. I mean, just, see, just to be able to write a part for the oboe that's for the oboe and the oboe plays, or a part for the second horn that second horn plays, you can't replace that. You know, that's orchestration right there. You can't replace that. We've had to make compromises to do this music. There's no, there's no doubt about it. That's, I mean, that's an elephant in the room there. You have to make compromises to write this adaptable music whereby lots of instruments can play, are able to play a single part. And so with that compromise, um, I think it allows lots and lots of ensembles that hadn't in the past been able to play our music are now able to play our music. And that's a good thing, but it will never replace concert band music. I just have to say also, I just love seeing all the people together. I, I, I don't, we can't even do this in California. I see all these people together, like groups of little pairs of people. I see a Natalie person, they're partying on through this whole thing. I see another group here that's paired off here. And I'm wondering, oh yeah, there's a Lydia and a Sydney. Does that, is that, how do you guys get to do that? How are you able to do that? Is it that your college roommates? Maybe that's it. Yeah, is that what yeah we're mean? roommates. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> it makes me jealous because we can't, you know, we can't do much of anything here in California. Anyway, that's my long answer to your question. I'll chime in. Go for it. I think, uh, you know, what, what I'm, the, edu the educators I'm working with right now that, are finding really great success, you know, the silver lining with the, with this pandemic. You know, they're they're shifting their focus from the normal ensemble focus of okay, you know, we got to rehearse the music, blend, like get ready for this concert. To hey, how can we show? Well, number one, keep our students engaged. How are we going to do that? Well, let's keep them not only playing music but more engaged in creativity and you know, getting the satisfaction and fulfillment that comes from creating music, or at least being part of the creation process, you know, getting like, like Frank's piece. I mean, that's a perfect example of the students are having to make a bunch of the compositional choices. And, and, you know, like snitching in the kitchen where you guys are going to make a bunch of the compositional choices there. 
uh, those pieces and that mentality seems to be really effective right now. Um, I, and I think that will last uh, afterwards that some, at least some educators will, will realize, wow, I can keep, I, I can still do concert band music, you know, large ensemble or string ensemble, whatever, but I can have an element of my program that's showing kids that how they can be creative in music, not just sit there and play the notes written on the page. Jeff, do you want to chime in? Um, I agree 100% with everything they said. Um, I'm not going to elaborate um, and say the same things as them again. And I see we have a bunch of questions over on the side, so I'll, okay. I'll pass. <laughs> uh, so let, let's, I'll start to read through this list of, of questions here. Um, for, for anyone on the panel, have uh, any aspects of your writing, uh, are there any aspects of your writing that you've discovered in this COVID time uh, that you would want to keep into the future? It's open to any any one of you. Yeah, um, I, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I actually uh, became sick with the virus um, in March and April and <clears throat> had to live um, on the bottom floor of our house away from my, my family. Um, and it was a really surreal, like three weeks of my life, uh, having to like FaceTime my kids from the, the floor beneath them when I can like hear their footsteps and hear their TV shows and things like that. Um, and that sort of, uh, unfortunately, it, it's not the most happiest sounding uh, music that resulted from that, but um, <clears throat> it definitely helped me find a, a side of my writing that was a little bit more expressive than what I'm used to um, and helped me sort of uh, represent what I was, you know, feeling like loneliness and, um, you know, depression and things like that, that have never been super prevalent before in my music or even in my actual feelings. So it, um, in a way sort of expanded my um, writing style in terms of like the emotions that I could actually uh, portray. Jennifer, Frank, Ben, Jennifer. Um, I have um, really been delving more into sound design, um, working with Logic. Um, this whole thing started with just Apple loops that I was, that I was doing in GarageBand um, just to do something fast for the students. And I've started actually designing my own sounds and, and playing with a lot of new synthesizers on Logic and I just have so much fun with it. But it, this, this has also given me the chance to um, put those two fields of music together that I was really um, nervous about putting together and releasing to the world because I didn't think it was gonna be accepted by a lot of the band directors that I've met. Um, it's more, and of course, band directors I look up to, um, it's more of a traditional um, world out there, but with pieces um, that are incorporating electronics a little bit more, it's, it's really opening up the doors for this kind of style. And, and so I hope to keep that, but the stuff that I wrote before, um, I've always done a little bit electroacoustic. Um, this is more simplified because it is only for like three or four parts at a time. So I feel like I'm I'm working on counterpoint a lot more, um, and I'm losing my chord progressions that I used to really really love to work with because of just these stacked chords and. You know, multiphonics on trombone is fine and dandy if you can do it, but. <laughs> uh, we have a, a question here for, uh, for uh, Frank. Why did you specifically choose to use uh, Dorian in this piece? And how did you choose their rhythmic and melodic patterns? Uh, I'll answer the second part first. Um, just the rhythm, I chose rhythms that would complement each other. Um, Jennifer was just talking about counterpoint. Counterpoint is part is largely a rhythmic thing, and you create voices so that their rhythms complement each other. That so that their rhythms are independent of one another, and then when they're combined, they form a composite rhythm that's interesting and compelling to the ear. And so the rhythms I chose largely did just that. So one part's ba 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 
ba, on the downbeat. The other part might be ba, 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 ah, ah, ah. So it's more upbeat things. And so you get then the complementation of the two coming together. Uh, why Dorian mode? I, I, you know, I don't know. I love, maybe I love the timelessness of that mode. It's been around for centuries and centuries and centuries. And there's a certain association with the mode, maybe a little bit of pathos that appeals to me. It's, it's, not, it's not as dark a mode as some others, like Phrygian is a darker mode and more mysterious. It's, but there's a pathos to it that seemed, uh, it seemed uh, to fit the times we're in right now. There's pathos, but there's not a lack of, complete lack of hope in the mode either. There's also a folk-like quality associated with that mode as well. Uh, ben, we have a question for you. Do you see yourself staying with this style of composition that includes uh, fixed media? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, b before the pandemic, for the last, I don't know, three or four years, I've been doing a lot with EA music. Electroacoustic, that stands for. Uh, and most of them are what we call fixed media. It doesn't mean that it's broken. It just means that it's, you hit play and it goes. Like there's no live electronic elements. Uh, but I've also done stuff with live electronics. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier with video, and I definitely, I, I will be continuing in that way. And likely post pandemic, incorporating more theatrical elements and visual elements as well. Cause I'm, I'm really enjoying that right now. Uh, ben, Jeff and Jennifer, let me ask you a sort of a general question about this idea of using fixed media. Um, uh, of course, this is not unique to our times for ever and a day, ever since we've had recorded sound. Uh, you know, we've had electronic uh, media that's been sort of incorporated into all kinds of music. Um, as time progressed though, the, the, the formats that composers used have changed. So Frank, maybe some music from the 1950s, 1960s that you had reel-to-reel -reel tapes that you would incorporate into your music. Well, nobody has a reel-to-reel -reel tape anymore. How do you, as you're writing music, how do you take into consideration the fact that um, the the actual format that people are gonna use to play back your, the, the accompaniment tracks, it might be obsolete in five years or 10 years or 20 years. Does that play a role in how you make your decisions? It doesn't for me because I wrote a piece um, 20 years ago for a um, tuba professor. It was my first full, well, no, actually a trombone piece for my now husband. Um, and it was for CD and trombone. And I started out with CDs, but you can't do CDs anymore. You just have to adapt with the times and change it as it goes. And somebody wanted to perform an old piece of mine, so I had to update the technology. Um, but the good thing about instrumentalists is we don't have to worry about our instruments being obsolete. So electronics may play a role for you know a decade or two, or maybe another 75 years, but the instruments will never go obsolete, so. Jeff or Ben, do you want to add something to that? Nope. Okay. I, um, I stereo right and left. I mean, whether it's on a CD or on, on a device, I don't think they're going away anytime soon anyway. Oh, they might get more tracks. Like maybe eventually we'll have some type of more surround sound that we can plug into our ears. I don't know how exactly that would work, but when that comes, cool. I'll be definitely writing for it. <laughs> And remixing old pieces to be in five channel surround sound, you know. Cool. Uh, Frank, we, we, I just want to pass on, we have a lot of comments in the chat window, uh, people thanking you for uh, some wonderful musical memories playing various pieces from Vesuvius, American Elegy, uh, you know, Loch Lomond, whatever it happens to be. So uh, you have a, a lot of fans here in the Sacred Heart Band. So just thank you for, for your music. Thank, um, thank we you. Have time for thank you all for your, for your kind words. I really appreciate it.
We have time for just one last question here. Um, and we, when we started our age of Zoom back in the spring, uh, we, we brought on a number of, uh, of, of guests and artists and that kind of thing. And it sort of became a tradition that at the end of every session, uh, somebody would ask them a question which is always asked of every uh, band member that comes here to Sacred Heart. And so I'm gonna ask it to you. And if you'd be so kind as to share your answers, we'd love to hear it. Uh, the question is, what is your favorite ice cream? Chocolate. Frank, go ahead. Chocolate ice cream. It's it's better than uh, anything. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? Well, um, I'm a type 1 diabetic, so I'm offended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, if I had to choose a flavor to, to hurt myself with, it would definitely be cookies and cream. Um, Jennifer, I see you're unmuted there. Um, mint chocolate chip. And Ben. Oh man, I like, oh, I love ice cream. Uh, you're asking me like pick one of my favorite kids. What? Uh, I just had Brookie tonight. It's, it's a Kroger thing, but man, it's good. Brookie, you guys know that brand or that flavor? I mean, I, I don't know. Nobody knows Brookie. All right, go to Kroger, get yourself some Brookie and brown. Yeah, it's like okay. Brookie dough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Frank to Kelly, Ben Taylor, Jennifer Rose, Jeff Harwig. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everything that you've been doing for us. Uh, your music and the kinds of music that you have uh, been writing has really allowed us to continue to play. Uh, during the pandemic. So thank you also very much. Uh, for everybody else in the Sacred Heart Band who is here and our guests who are joining us, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this weekend, of course, is Halloween. Uh, please, please, please stay safe. Uh, be mindful of where you are and of large gatherings. Uh, we are getting so close to the end of the semester. Uh, we want to continue to do what it is that we're doing so that we can all go home um, and enjoy our Thanksgivings. Thank you all so very much, and I will talk to you all soon.